the Millikan experiments and the integrity of data. Previously, we said we are dropping the demarcation problem and now trying to draw a line within science, an epistemically meaningful line between good and junk science. To do that, we said we will look at specific cases. We have already discussed four cases of scientists cheating and getting caught. Although these cases were interesting, they didn't tell us exactly what the difference between good science and junk science is. Today, we will examine a case involving a scientist who was accused of cheating. At least part of the accusations seem false. Perhaps the case will help us solve Laudan's epistemic problem. The scientist in question is the famous experimental physicist Robert Millikan, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for demonstrating that all electrons have the same charge and for measuring that charge for the first time. Millikan came under criticism after his death for falsification and plagiarism. Was he guilty? To understand the question, we need to understand what he did. In his famous oil drop experiment, Millikan used what looks like a weird pressure cooker. This is how the inside looked like. Here's the procedure. First, fine oil is sprayed in the perfume atomizer. This produces a fine mist of oil drops. Some of these drops fall through a hole in a compartment between two electrically charged plates. In that compartment, the drops are hit with high energy radiation, which induces a positive electrical charge in the drops. Remember the electrically charged plates? Those plates generate an electrical field, which pulls the positively charged drops down. If that flew over your head, no worries. Let's understand the behavior of the oil drops. First, let's look at the simpler case, without the electric field. Let's say this yellow thing is a spherical oil drop. It is falling through the contraption. There are a few forces acting on it. The first one is, is its weight, or Fg. It is pulling down. Fg equals m times g. By the way, the math will soon look complicated, but you don't need to remember any of the specific equations or formulas. M is the mass of the drop. G is Earth's gravitational acceleration. How do you calculate the drop's mass? It's easy. The mass of anything is its volume times its density. Then we substitute M for the volume of the drop times its density. And we get this. But what is V? How do we calculate the volume of the drop? Remember, we assume that the drop is a sphere, and this is the formula for the volume of a sphere. We again do the substitution, which gives us this. Okay, this is the equation for the weight of the drop, the force pulling it down. In this formula, we know g, Earth's gravitational acceleration. It is for the record, 9.8 meters per second square. We know the density of oil. We know pi, it is somewhere around the neighborhood of 3.14. But what is R? R is the radius of the drop. How can we know that? Remember, on that weird pressure cooker, there was a telescopic eyepiece. That is for observing the oil drops. In fact, using that eyepiece, one could measure how large the drops are, which gives us R. So we know every variable and constant in this equation. That means we can compute the weight of each drop just by looking at them. The second force is air resistance or drag which always acts in the direction against an object's motion relative to air. Since the drop is falling down, drag will pull it up. This is the formula for drag. C stands for the cross section of the drop. Mu air is the viscosity of air. And lowercase v 
is how fast a drop is falling through air. What is the value of C, the cross-section of a drop? That's easy. Since the drop is a sphere, its cross-section is a circular disk. We did the substitution, which gives us this. What is the viscosity of air, though? Viscosity is what makes honey goopy and oil slippery. Air is also a fluid. It too has viscosity, although it is very low relative to liquids like honey, even oil. But it still exists and can be calculated. The exact formula is complex, and I will spare you the details. But to simplify, the viscosity of air is proportional to air pressure divided by air temperature. That means when pressure increases, air becomes more viscous. When temperature increases, air becomes less viscous. Again, we do the substitution, and we get this. So we have the formula for air drag. We know pi. We can measure R. We can measure air temperature and pressure. And we can measure how fast the drop is falling, again, by using the eyepiece. So once again, everything in the formula is known, which is to say air drag can be calculated just like weight. The last force acting on the drop is buoyancy. Buoyancy is the force that makes objects float in water, like these rubber duckies. Air, too, has buoyancy. That's how balloons can float. But not just balloons. Everything in the atmosphere is subject to buoyancy. In fact, this very moment you are experiencing a buoyancy force pulling you up. If you were to weigh yourself in a vacuum, you would weigh just a little bit less. I will spare you the computation this time, but trust me, the formula is something very close to this. And just like before, we know all the constants and variables in the formula. That means we know all the forces acting on the oil drop. How does that help Millikan measure the charge of an electron? Well, it doesn't. To measure the charge of an electron, we need to add one more force, the force pulling the positively charged drops down. So on top of those three forces unaffected by electricity, we add one more, the Coulomb force. The Coulomb force equals E times Q, the strength of the electrical field times the charge of the drop. The strength of the electrical field is known. In fact, Millikan and his assistant could set this field strength to whatever value they wished. But what is the charge of the drop? We can compute it using Newton's second law of motion. The net force acting on an object, according to this law, equals the object's mass times its acceleration. So if a drop is moving at a constant speed, net force acting on the drop would be zero. So when we add up all four forces acting on the drop, they should add up to zero. When we expand the Coulomb force, we get this. When we tidy up a bit, Q equals minus weight plus drag plus buoyancy divided by electric field strength. Remember, we know all these values, or at least we can compute them. So we can compute the charge of the oil drops. But how does knowing the charge of an oil drop help us know the charge of a single electron? When Millikan graphed the charge of each drop, it looked like this. There's something weird about this graph. Some of the drop are all at one value. Some are all at another value. And some others are all at another value. And very interestingly, 
these values are all multiples of a particular value. That means for each drop, Q is a multiple of the electron's charge. Finally, we know what it is. And here it is, if you are curious. 1.602176634 times 10 to the power minus 19 Coulomb. Moving on to the accusations. The first accusation is that Millikan falsified evidence. Millikan's lab notebooks contain data on 175 individual drops. However, in the research paper reporting the results, he reports data on only 58 of them. What is more, he says, it is to be remarked too that this is not a selected group of drops but represents all of the drops experimented upon during 60 consecutive days. Remember, falsification is changing or omitting data or results. Here it seems obvious that Millikan omitted data. Or is it so? Remember how Millikan got to Q. I said he knew everything on the right side of the equation, and he used them to compute Q. When you blow up the right side, you get this complex-looking formula. But my point isn't to intimidate you with math. I said Millikan knew the value of everything in this equation. But the reality isn't as simple. Take R, for instance, the radius of a drop. When a drop is too small or too large, it doesn't allow reliable measurements. Small drops are affected too much by air molecules bumping into them. So they bounce around instead of falling down nice and steady. Large drops are too heavy and they fall too fast. Milgram's notes include comments about several drops, complaining about them being too small or too large. So it isn't unreasonable to guess that Milgram discarded these measurements as unreliable. What is more, air pressure and temperature aren't constant. Remember, this experiment was done in the early 1900s. It was before the era of clean rooms and air conditioners. Sudden changes in temperature and air pressure could potentially ruin a measurement. This is again supported by Millikan's lab notes. He often notices and comments on sudden drops or increases in pressure. He might have very well discarded these abortive measurements and reported only 58 drops out of 175. But then what do we do with his blatantly false statement? It is to be remarked too that this is not a selected group of drops, but represents all of the drops experimented upon during 60 consecutive days. As you might remember, according to inductivism, the scientific method has four steps. The second step is relevant here. Observed and recorded facts should be analyzed and classified without any hypotheses or postulates. But we previously dismissed this as unrealistic. Indeed, scientists do and should make hypotheses and postulates as they analyze and classify facts. Scientists aren't supposed to report everything they observe without selection. Scientists should use theory and experimenters' experience to select data that is representative of the phenomena they are studying. If you don't know what I'm talking about, think of a simpler example. Imagine one of your friends is training for a race. They ask you to measure how fast they can run a given distance. The friend starts running and you are waiting there with a stopwatch in your hand. Then you sneeze and press the button on the stopwatch by accident, although your friend wasn't finished yet. Should you report to your friend this faulty measurement of yours as correct? Or should you say, hey, sorry, I messed up. You need to run again. By not including the faulty measurements, Millikan did the same thing. He knew that there was something wrong with some of his data. He knew that the data concerning too small or too large drops were unreliable. He knew that sudden changes in air pressure and temperature could change buoyancy and drag forces and ruin a calculation. That's why he discarded them and presented the best of his data. Of course, he could have been more transparent about this thought process. 
But lack of transparency is one thing, and falsifying evidence is another. The second accusation Milliken faces is plagiarism. In this case, Milliken is accused of plagiarizing the work of his research assistant, Harvey Fletcher. Fletcher played a significant role in the experiment. In fact, he is responsible for a few of the technical breakthroughs, such as the idea of using machine oil and a perfume atomizer. He wasn't perhaps the brains behind the experiment, but it would have been difficult, if not impossible, without his contributions. Sadly, however, Fletcher received no credit for this famous experiment. Milliken offered them sole authorship in a much less impressive paper and published the paper about electrons charge all by himself. Fletcher was surprisingly loyal to his graduate advisor. In fact, he made sure that the story didn't come out until his own death. Now, isn't this a clear case of failure to credit? There are some facts that are relevant to answering the question. First, Fletcher agreed to the arrangement. If being credited is a right, then it can be waived. And Fletcher waived it. Therefore, there is nothing wrong with Millikan's actions, one might say. Furthermore, Fletcher got something back. He got sole authorship for another paper. So instead of getting published as the second author for two papers, he got published as the sole author for one paper. Yet Millikan was Fletcher's graduate advisor. This last fact complicates the issue. In grad school, getting along with your advisor is a matter of professional survival. If you upset your advisor, they might make a few strategic phone calls and you might find yourself unemployable in your field. So, it is not entirely clear if Fletcher's agreement can be seen as voluntary consent. The power inequality between Millikan and Fletcher was perhaps too large for consent to be possible. So, I think Millikan was guilty of plagiarism. Still, it is noteworthy that Millikan committing plagiarism doesn't implicate the results he reported. To this day, newer and better methods of measurement yielded no significant improvement over Millikan's measurement. Can Millikan's story teach us anything useful about differentiating good science and junk science? First and foremost, unethical scientists can still do good science. Even though Millikan was scum who exploited his student, the results he reported are as accurate as they get. Second, interpersonal and institutional power dynamics can render actions that would otherwise be permissible unethical. What is more, Good science isn't about observing and reporting facts without any hypotheses or postulates. Once again, we see that inductivism doesn't work. Finally, there is no fast and easy way of understanding the difference between good science and cheating. You must understand the underlying science to tell them apart. This brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience, and I'll catch you next time.